We also welcome Mr. Jerry Thedoro. Mr. Thedoro is the Director of Finance, Insurance, and Trade Policy Program at the R Street Institute. And thank you. Uh, Mr. Theodoro, you are now recognized for five minutes to give your oral remarks. Vice Chair De La Cruz, Ranking Member Cleaver, Chairman Davidson, esteemed members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding today's hearing and for the invitation to testify. My name is Jerry Theodoro. I lead the R Street Institute's finance, insurance, and trade program. My focus at R Street is analysis of the property and casualty insurance industry. My research, publications, public presentations, and congressional testimony have focused on drivers of insurer performance and the impact of market and external factors on insurers, policyholders, and the economy. Today's hearing is timely because environmental, social, and governance factors can influence insurers' performance, and by extension, the availability and cost of insurance for consumers and businesses. Government mandates impacting the insurance industry, including ESG mandates, can distort insurance markets, leading to less cost and higher costs, uh, less choice and higher costs for insurance buyers. Examples of the ways that government or regulatory mandates can distort insurance markets include monopolies for certain insurance products and intervention in how insurers may calculate their rates. For example, workers' compensation insurance is provided by a state-run monopoly in four states, Ohio, North Dakota, Washington, and Wyoming. The absence of private insurers there deprives employers from product choice in such a non-competitive market. In North Carolina, a rate bureau promulgates insurance rates. The state's rate bureau has been compared to a cartel because insurance companies set and use the bureau rates, depriving customers, buyers of insurance of choice. In California, regulatory overreach has disrupted the insurance market in three ways by prohibiting insurers from incorporating reinsurance costs into rate making, by prohibiting insurers from factoring current weather trends into rate calculations, and by allowing interveners to challenge rate change requests with the implementation of the intervener process in transparent. As a result, many national insurers are curtailing their California insurance business. ESG mandates can also impact the availability and cost of insurance if insurers are barred from insuring certain energy risks. Because power plants cannot operate without insurance, they will find coverage outside the standard market, from Lloyd's or from the surplus insurance marketplace where costs are generally higher. ESG mandates can also adversely impact the insurance industry's large investment portfolio. The property and casualty industry holds $1.2 trillion in bonds. Life insurers hold an additional $3.4 trillion in bonds. This is nearly 10% of the aggregate $51 trillion U.S. bond market. If, e if ESG mandates compel or prohibit investment in certain issues, insurers' investment income can be compromised, leading to higher insurance rates to meet shareholder return expectations. The core activity of insurers is to allocate capital to risk. Premiums reflect risk magnitude. Past losses and claims payments are signals that inform insurers about risk. If government bodies mandate rating factors that insurance companies may or may not incorporate into pricing, rate is decoupled from risk and the market is disrupted. If insurers are coerced to price policies without regard for risk magnitude, they will abandon markets. So if the ESG is mandated with the government replacing the judgment of the private sector, it has deleterious impacts. But if it's private sector driven, it can be a useful tool in the toolkit. Mandates impacting insurers' coverage, price, or investment decisions render insurers less able to fulfill their three critical roles in the economy. And these are, paying for claims from disasters and other losses, enabling businesses to take on risks that, would not other, that they would not otherwise take, and buying municipal government and corporate bonds to support our nation's infrastructure and to satisfy 
America's need for capital, corporate America. Because the insurance industry plays such a vital role in the economy, mandates that may disrupt the industry deserve serious consideration. Exploration of the impact of ESG on insurers is therefore a timely and important undertaking. Thank you for having this hearing and thank you for listening to my views. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Theodoro, uh, I want to focus for a second on some of the self-inflicted problems in certain state insurance markets like California, which you mentioned. That seemed to uh, have a regulatory bias against insurers transferring risk from their balance sheets to the global reinsurance marketplace. What I've seen, the SGE regulatory activism in California might be the worst of all. Right now, California is the only state in the country that does not allow insurers rates to be based on their actual reinsurance costs. So as reinsurance costs go up, insurers cannot have those, their rates reflect those higher costs. As a result, more reinsurance are starting to treat wildfires, wildfires as a primary risk and not a secondary peril. The cost of reinsurance has shot up while the primary, uh, cost of primary insurance companies of underwriting wildfire risk has stayed more or less flat. The natural result here is either insurers have to purchase less reinsurance or they will pull back from issuing new homeowners coverage in the state, as three of the California's top insurers have done in this last year. So Californians get fewer options and higher prices while the willing risk capacity of the $630 billion global reinsurance market goes underutilized. Mr. Theodore, does it make any sense to you that California would deliberately discourage the use of reinsurance at a time when its primary insurers are actively fleeing its homeowners market? How would you, how would you, uh, how would the great use of global reinsurance risk, uh, reinsurance and risk sharing help to benefit California consumers? Yes, thank you, Congressman Lukemeyer, for, for that question. Uh, indeed, in, in California, where the cost of reinsurance is not permitted to be included in, in insurance rate making, you have a, you have a catch-22. The, uh, the, the reinsurance rates are going up because the risk is going up, and the insurers have their hands tied, and they can't get more than a 6.9% increase. If it goes into the intervener process, it may be extended beyond the 60 days. So it's unfortunate that California can't use reinsurance to, to its benefit. And then to the question uh, earlier, too, about reinsurance, reinsurance capacity is there. The uh, citizens in Florida, got a billion dollars of reinsurance from uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, TWIA, the Texas Wind Insurance Authority, secured over a billion dollars of reinsurance protection from the, from the private reinsurance industry, and also from the cat bond industry. So reinsurers do have the capital, and they're willing to deploy it if they can make a, a, a fair margin. So, uh, and there are uh, people that are standing on the sidelines, as Berkshire Hathaway was last year, when they didn't participate in the citizens program because the rates were inadequate. It would seem to me that, you know, it, it, if, you were allow, if you were incentivized to use the reinsurance market more, it would actually drive down your costs. I know uh, when I was chairman of this committee six and a half years ago, we were working on flood insurance, and we wanted to use the reinsurance market to help that situation. And if we would have done it over the previous 20 years, we actually would have paid all of our claims Never been, uh, never had anything, uh, any any tax bills go to the taxpayers, and still would have had coverage at the at a, at a minimum rate increase. So <laughs> there's a there's a place for it. Was the percentage of increase in insurance costs due to the SG regulations, Mr. Theodore? You know, can offhand. The uh, uh, I don't have a number uh, for uh, for this. The main uh, ESG. Uh, Litig uh, not litigation, legislation is directed at state public pension funds. Okay. Um, Ms. Hewitt. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, you know, this is, I think, our third hearing on this. It's, it's bizarre to me because, you know, one of the things that I've been really appreciative of um, previous administrations and others been talking about uh, you know, movement around, you know, weatherization and, you know, even manufactured homes doing the kind of upfront, and it does cost money up front, but it leads to reducing, you know, um, reliance, you know, high, you know, utility bills, you know, energy efficiency leads to actually lower bills for many of the families and they can't afford it. So it's not all going, you know, right out the window when we don't have some of those investments um, at the front end. So it's really bizarre for me, and we continue to hear this as, oh, 
the whole housing crisis is because of this, uh, is just, I'm taken aback. Uh, because it, you know, we all know it existed before even the ESG even was invented or, or created. And so, you know, I know in my district, for instance, you know, the, uh, the tax foreclosure crisis was, was just unbelievable. We had one of the worst tax foreclosure crisis in the country. These are families that actually own their homes, but they could not pay for their property taxes. ESG had nothing to do with it, nothing. Actually, probably if it did, maybe there would have been some sort of best practices or policies implemented. But they're also acting like ESG is like binding. Is ESG binding? Ms. Nagy? It really depends on, on whether by law it is. Yeah, they decide. Standard, yeah. Is it binding? Uh, it depends on the legislation and possible litigation. I know, but we're, right now, right now, ESG policies, is it binding? Is it forcing people to, yeah, is it, is it binding? It's not. It's advisory, right? It, it's, it's like you should look into this. It's a, it's a factor that can be looked at because it may have correlation with risk magnitude and it's consistent with fiduciary duty in the investment community. Sure, sure. H how about you, Mayor? Uh, Mr. Third Theodoro, uh, can you just quickly discuss the Federal Insurance Office, their accumulation of power in, in recent years? Thank you, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald, for the question. Indeed, the Federal Insurance Office was created uh, as part of Dodd-Frank because it was thought that insurance companies were in part responsible for the global financial crisis, which was not the case. It was uh, banking and non-bank lending institutions. And the role as a, in statute of the FIO is to monitor the insurance industry. There's no regulatory powers there, but as you uh, have suggested, uh, Congressman, there has been more intrusion and requests, data calls, and I think duplicative data calls because most of the large insurers, especially the publicly traded ones, already make detailed granular climate disclosures, either in their 10K or in other uh, publications or disclosures. So to me, it's, it's uh, disturbing that it's like the, uh, the nose of the camel is in the tent and then the rest of the body is uh, gonna follow strikes me as a, an agency that's looking for a purpose. Right. Because monitoring, writing reports, is, ha, hasn't helped the industry that I have seen in a material way. Yeah. I want to just uh, switch uh, gears here and go to the auto insurance market. The average California annual rate for auto insurance in 2023 was $2,462. Meanwhile, the average rate in my home state of Nebraska, $1,538. That's a striking difference of almost $1,000 annually. California fashions itself as the home of innovation, but its broken insurance and regulatory framework doesn't even allow drivers voluntarily to share telematics data with the insurers in exchange for lower rates to reward good driving. For those who may not be familiar with the term, telematics uh, can be installed in a car to track speed, harsh braking, or other indicators that may affect an insurance rate. Basically, by allowing drivers to opt into this, you're giving them an opportunity to lower their rates by demonstrating they're a good, safe driver. Uh, Mr. Theodoro, can you discuss how the use of innovative technology like telematics in auto insurance could lower rates, something Californians miss out on and Nebraskans take advantage of? Yes, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Indeed, telematics can lower costs. If we look at the history of automobile insurance rating, we start with bureau rating where the rates were set, and then segmentation, looking at city drivers versus farmers, for example, looking at risk factors, and then more granular segmentation, and then the, evolu the development of big data, so pulling in different data elements, because insurance companies are, by and large, in the data management business. They look at the data. So telematics data even makes it more specific, which it looks at things like hard braking or turns that are very abrupt, and it feeds this information back to the driver and to the insurance company so that the risk based on the quality of the driving helps to determine the price. So the capital the, uh, is allocated according to the, the level of the risk. So it's uh, sort of um, uh, counterproductive to ignore this kind of data. It's being used in the trucking industry. Commercial auto insurance is benefiting from trucks that have front-facing cameras that look at driver behavior, are they falling asleep, and feeds this data back, and it Thank leads you, Mr. to lower Thank you, Mr. I must uh, yield my time.
Uh, Mr. Theodoro, uh, when I think about pricing risk, you've committed a lot of work for it, and I just wonder if you could highlight some of the issues that we're confronting in the insurance space. Yes, thank you, Chairman Davidson, for the question. Uh, indeed, the price of reinsurance has risen in the January 1st renewals, the June 1st renewals, and the July 1st treaty renewals, and it's a major part of the costs of insurance policies after after administrative expenses and claims is the cost of reinsurance. And it's getting higher. Uh, the, the good news is that there is capital out there that's, that's coming in, private capital, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, other uh, asset owners. I, I appreciate that. And I just have to get one more question in. But, uh